thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Teresa, and I'll be moderating today's 90-minute webinar. I'd like to formally welcome you to today's event, Marine Transportation System Resilience Assessment Guide, a multi-agency effort presented by PNQSA. Before we get started, I'll take a quick moment to review the webinar platform. From the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, you can mute and unmute your line, and you can also do so from the participants panel. Use the chat panel to send questions or comments during the webinar. We'll address questions during the presentation as time allows, and we'll have a brief Q&A at the end of the webinar. All participants are eligible to receive one and a half professional development hours for attending today's event. A password is required to retrieve your customized PDH certificate, and we'll provide that password at the end of the webinar. If you have to duck out early, don't worry. A recording of today's event will be emailed to you and will be posted on PNQSA's YouTube channel. During today's webinar, we'll get a broad overview of resilience assessments before diving into three case studies. Just a quick note regarding today's presentation. The contents we'll be seeing today do not have the force and effect of law and are not meant to bind the public in any way. This document is intended only to provide clarity to the public regarding existing requirements under the law or agency policies. Finally, today's event is being hosted by PNQSA. If you're not familiar with PNQSA, it is the U.S. section of the World Association for Waterborne Transport Infrastructure. PNQSA brings together international experts on technical, economic, and environmental issues in the field of waterborne transportation. PNQSA regularly hosts events to discuss technical publications developed by our international working groups but we're pleased today to provide a platform to a multi-agency collaborative, including the Army Corps of Engineers, the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and our academic partners to discuss the Marine Transportation System Resilience Assessment Guide. Our first presenter today will be from Dr. Austin Becker, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Marine Affairs at the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Becker will be discussing insights from resilience initiatives at 10 U.S. seaports were conducted in collaboration with the DHS and the Army Corps of Engineers. Ports and port authorities are a part of a very complex system of decision making. There are lots of stakeholders, lots of overlapping jurisdictions. Different stakeholders have different priorities for the for the port and the port lands. And it's not very clear who is in a position to take the lead to implement resilience. And uh, the, the word graph that you see on the right here is from a study that we did in, in Rhode Island a few years back, where we asked the port stakeholders from Providence, you know, which entities should take the lead in resilience planning? And it was really all over the map. There were many suggestions, but no, no clear entity that, that really is in a position in terms of its incentive, incentive structures and its, um, and its jurisdictions and mandates to take the lead for long-term resilience planning. Um, but we do have a terrific tool at our disposal, um, and we're going to learn more about this tool uh, in, in this webinar, uh, the resilience assessment. So the resilience assessment can be conducted by really any of the entities in a, in a, in a port uh, or a supply chain system. Um, Often a port authority will take the lead on a resilience assessment. Uh, they will sometimes do it with their internal staff. They'll sometimes hire a consulting firm to conduct the assessment for them. Um, but it's really a way of, of you know, identifying vulnerabilities and identifying actions to reduce those vulnerabilities. Um, it's a participatory process and it typically will focus on the system as a whole, not so much on individual components of that system. 
So, in my group here in the Marine Affairs Department at URI, we uh, were interested in what are the benefits of conducting one of these resilience assessments? I mean, obviously, we, we think of them as a way to identify specific action items that can be taken to, to enhance resilience of a, of a port, for example. Um, but are there other benefits and are there challenges to conducting these that would be worth knowing about and, and worth informing folks who are planning to go through this type of a, uh, a process in the future? So we asked these three research questions that you see here, and this was part of this larger uh, development of the guide, um, the resilience uh, guide. So first, what are the key benefits and challenges for undertaking an assessment? What types of strategies do seaports uh, typically pursue after completing an ass assessment? And how do these this how does this assessment process help with building the adaptive capacity of a of a seaport entity? So we looked across the U.S. We identified uh, all of the ports within ten miles of the coast, and that amounts to about one hundred and twenty five. We got in contact with the CEOs and others who might have been involved with uh, a resilience process, and we narrowed it down to 10 ports that had gone through a resilience assessment process in the last 15 years. So we conducted a survey of the key personnel who were involved with that assessment and then followed up um, uh, from the survey with a focus group interviews so that we could really get at the heart of, of those questions. And I'm gonna focus just on the on that first question about the benefits and challenges of, um, of the resilience assessment process. So um, you're looking at a, a radar plot here and the, the uh, size of the wedge uh, corresponds with how many people who we interviewed talked about these broad categories of benefits to conducting the, the assessment. So <clears throat> we, um, we found that you know, the, the vast majority of folks we talked to felt that, they, that their organization got a, a more holistic understanding of their port's vulnerability. So no surprise there, um, conducting an, an assessment helps them understand what their vulnerabilities are and what, what they can do about them. Um, but it also had these other benefits. It helped them uh, enhance their social capital with other stakeholders at the port. So in both inside the port, so port tenants, for example, and outside the port. So that might be um, state agencies, for example, um, or environmental groups. Their leadership got a, a, a higher awareness of the value of performing these kinds of resilience building investments. Um, and it helped the port to um, to better explain their their uh, their vulnerabilities and their strategies in in climate change discourses. And there were a few others that um, that were mentioned as well. So we had lots of great quotes that came out of these interviews. Um, so just for example, um, one quote that fell into our our category of a more holistic understanding of their vulnerabilities. This person said, we'd never undertaken a study at that granularity that got down to our individual assets. We might have known anecdotally that a particular intersection floods or a particular building, a particular building needs to be built higher, um, but we never had a, a comprehensive way to look at those things together. Um, in terms of challenges, there were four key challenges that were identified in conducting these assessments. And uh, you know, they were first was engaging stakeholders. So getting people to the table is, is, um, is a challenge. Um, addressing hazards where they didn't have as much scientific data as they needed was a challenge. Um, that they didn't have a resilience assessment process to, to look to, uh, a model. Uh, for conducting one of these assessments was was a challenge, and that is answered through the through the guide process, which you'll hear about in a minute. Um, and there was fear that communicating their vulnerabilities to their stakeholders could have a negative impact on the on their marketability or reputation. So, in other words, they didn't want to go pointing out that they had these kinds of problems and risks um, for fear that their competitors or people in the community would, um, you know, would. Kind of find out about these things, and that could be that could be an issue for them. Um, so to to 
wrap this up and we have a we have a paper in press and it's part of the the um the appendix of the guide that you'll that you'll hear about um we found that there was a lot of value to conducting these assessments above and beyond identifying specific vulnerabilities and in particular they were a really good way to engage the other stakeholders of the port system in a dialogue that um, identified where problems might be across the whole system. And, and it helped to, to get buy-in from other stakeholders uh, so that people could kind of pool resources and think together about how they might, might go about reducing, reducing risk. So I'm going to stop there. We had a terrific steering committee, many of whom are are on this webinar, and you'll hear from them um, individually. And I'm happy to answer any questions now or uh, or at the end. So I will stop my screen share here and turn it back over to Teresa. Thanks so much, Dr. Becker. Um, so, yeah, we do have a few minutes for questions. If you have questions about Dr. Becker's work, feel free to drop them into the chat panel and we'll address them now or again, we'll have a brief Q&A at the end of today's webinar. And I'm not seeing any questions come in. So feel free again to drop those in the chat panel as they come to mind. But for now, we'll move on to our next section. Which will be an overview of the Marine Transportation System Resilience Assessment Guide from Ms. Catherine Chambers, Research Physical Scientist at the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center, or ERDIC, Javon Daniel, Program Manager and Project Lead at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and Joe Kendall, a Senior Project Manager at ABS Group. And before we dive into that question, Dr. Becker, one question did come in for you which is what kind of staff time is necessary for one of these kinds of assessments? Would you like to address that before we sure. jump into this next section? Uh, um, good question. And um, as you'll hear about uh, in the overview of the guide, there's really a broad um, range of approaches to doing one of these assessments. They can be, you know, you can do a kind of surface level scan, a self-assessment over the course of a day or two. Um, or you can do a much more detailed in-depth assessment, you know, over the course of uh, a few months. Um, so it really depends on the objectives of the, of the organization and how big the organization is. Um, many organizations will contract out to a, a consulting firm to take the lead, um, but others may have staff in-house that have the necessary expertise to do it. Um, and I think you know using using the, the the guide that will be described here can 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 offer some um, you know some guidance on 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 how to how to put one of these together um, given the resources that you have available. Thanks so much, Dr. Becker. And it sounds like we'll get a little bit more information on that as we move into this next section. So with that, I'll hand things over to Ms. Catherine Chambers. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Catherine Chambers. I work for the Army Corps of Engineers Engineer Research and Development Center, and I'm going to talk about the reason why we're all together today. Um, we have been working for the past several years on the um, development of an assessment guide. And hopefully Dr. Becker has sufficiently convinced you all that resilience assessments are useful tools um, in moving us forward. And we would like to describe some of our findings based on um, a whole lot of experience that our agencies have um, in trying to understand this concept. So next. All right, so let me reiterate just a little bit, um, some of the challenges that Dr. Becker went over. There 
<laughs> when you're trying to define the marine transportation system, or honestly, really any coastal system, um, there is a lot, a major challenge in scoping um, and trying to figure out exactly what you need to care about and what needs to be included in any work that you do. Um, so what you're looking at here is two diagrams sort of illustrating the stressors and disruptions that could um, affect the MTS, including external things like global supply chain issues, funding, tidal forces and sea conditions, threatened and endangered species and communities, competing uses, things get busy on the waterway, and then internal components like trade relationships and ship alliances, labor force, intermodal exchange, navigation systems. There is so much to consider um, within your system and so much to consider in terms of things that could potentially disrupt uh, your function. There's also, as Dr. Becker mentioned, an enormous diversity of stakeholders who contribute to resilience. Um, and resilience has always sort of suffered from collective action problems. It can take a great deal of coordination and collaboration across these diverse groups to make meaningful progress. Um, and it's the third point I'd like to make on this slide is that resilience has been a topic of interest for many years. Um, and it really, you know, started after Hurricane Sandy back in 2012, at least that's when federal agencies started talking about it more and the need to develop resilience to future events. Um, and its prevalence has resulted in many tools and methods and resources attempting to define it and understand it. But there is some gap in between those resources and decision making capabilities or ways that you can apply them to specific problems within the marine transportation system. So the guide was an effort um, across different our CISA, ERDIC, and the Coastal Center of or Coastal Resilience Center universities to answer this problem. Um, we really wanted to build on our past experiences. CISA has almost a decade of experience conducting regional resilience assessments, and ERDIC has a lot of experience in the maritime domain and working analytical methods for conducting assessments. Um, and the universities will bring obvious experience that they will show you via case studies in a little bit. Um, and just one more point is this presentation and context are yet pre-decisional. Pre we hope that it'll make it through the review, final review process and be released in the fall. And we'll be certain to let you know when that happens. So the purpose of the guide broadly, um, there's three things that we wanted to do. It was to recommend an under or develop a shared understanding of how to design and conduct a resilience assessment of the marine transportation system to work to close the gap between available resources and needs by organizing and identifying the many planning tools, studies, data sets, and methods that can be useful. And finally, to illustrate the assessment through examples and case studies. Um, th those illustrations we think are the most important part to this work. Um, so we devoted a lot of this panel to showing you how to do resilience assessments in the real world. Next slide. So this might be familiar to a lot of folks. Resilience um, needs to be defined every single time you present on it so we can all be on the same page. But for us, we use um, sort of the standard federal approach of a four-step process where we work to prepare for and adapt to changing conditions and withstand and recover rapidly from disruptions. So here's that bathtub curve that you see often where you focus on a particular function over time, something that you would care about. For the marine transportation system, we've defined this function as moving goods and people. So in order to apply resilience, uh, in this case, we're saying that there's a period of anticipation or preparation. Once an event occurs, you withstand or absorb the, the hazard, and then you have a time period where you're responding and recovering to the event. And hopefully, after the event um, is over and your response and your function is back to normal, 
you would focus on adapting or improving your ability to um, be resilient to the next hazard. Finally, I would say resilience doesn't need to be separate from risk management and planning processes that MTS organizations regularly engage in. It's an outcome of effective risk, risk management and broadening your risk management practices to incorporate things like infrastructure dependencies or um, you know, longer term planning. Next. So I mentioned earlier that the marine transportation system is difficult to scope, but here was our best attempt to do it. Foc focusing on those functions of moving goods and people, we divided the MTS into three different scopes, a single port, um, a marine transportation system network, and an inland waterway. Each of these scopes have very unique sort of um, characteristics that we hope you will see through case studies that we've selected to illustrate them. Um, Dr. Martin Schultz will be presenting a case study on the Port of Portland. Uh, Dr. David Young will be presenting on the Caribbean supply chain and Dr. Craig Phillip and Miguel Moravec will be presenting later on um, a river system. So for each of these scopes, um, the guide contains information on stakeholders, infrastructure dependencies, guidance, and other considerations. Okay, so let's get to applying the guide. This guide offers a process that can be used by a whole variety of marine transportation system stakeholders, including public and private and agencies that support ports and commercial functions, federal, state, and local governments, terminal operators, port authorities, regional, state, and emergency planners, and others. Um, there are a whole bunch of different questions that it could be used to answer, um, including like creating redundancy for supply chain operations, reducing recovery time after hazards, investing in infrastructure upgrades or um, collaborative government governance and contingencies. And you'll he see here in this diagram that there's a standard process that's built off of CISA's Regional Resilience Assessment Program, which they've been doing for a decade. We didn't wanna change things too much there, but we wanted to highlight how this could be applied specifically to the MTS from pre-assessment all the way through designing, connecting with resources, conducting the assessment and implementing process. The key part here though, is that this process is built on top of four key resilience assessment objectives that we say should be included to some degree in any sort of resilience assessment. Next. To dive a little bit deeper into these um, key resilience objectives, they are <laughs> defining functions and characterizing your system in a steady state, analyzing the critical infrastructure and dependencies, understanding the impacts of disruptive events, and identifying and evaluate, evaluating resilience enhancement alternatives. Next slide. Okay, so just to dig into these a little bit more, the first one, defining functions and characterizing the system. Um, the purpose of this is to provide a baseline for your resilience assessment. And to support this, the guide provides a framework for breaking down each function into constituent subfunctions and the infrastructure systems that support them. For example, here you can see for navigable waterways, the physical logistics of moving containers is supported by navigation activities, which are supported by infrastructure systems like dredging the channel, aids to navigation, pilotage, tug services, locks and jams, et cetera. Next slide. Next, we have analyzing infrastructure and dependencies. This, the purpose here is to really understand how the complex elements of the systems interact with and rely on each other. So a key finding from doing years of resilience assessments is that when things go wrong, usually it's because there's an underlying dependency that even if we knew about it, it wasn't very well understood or planned for. So the guide attempts to provide a framework for thinking about dependencies generally, as well as an appendix that goes into detail on common dependencies you'd find throughout the marine transportation system. For example, here is an illustration of a liquid bulk terminal, um, and there've been, we've developed lots of infographics for typical common um, infrastructure systems. 
Next slide. The third key objective of a resilience assessment is to understand the impacts of disruptive events. This occurs after you've figured out how your system works and the dependencies. You need to select relevant hazards and place the system under stress to figure out what pieces are most likely to break and what pieces will have the biggest consequences if they end up failing. So the guide provides just general guidance on this concept, um, as well as a suite of resources and methods for conducting risk assessments that can be right-sized to the purpose, scope, and available resources that you'd have to conduct it. Next. The last objective is evaluating alternatives. And the intent here is to provide a structured approach for risk management decisions under different constraints. So like, how do you buy down your risk and how do you get your biggest return on investment giving us given a suite of alternatives? So the guide provides a series of resources and methods for developing and evaluating these alternatives and an appendix for common methods on reducing risk gleaned from past assessments. So we'll revisit this assessment process really quickly. You can see down on the bottom, we've got those four key objectives and we wanna walk users through them to fully understand them before they begin the pre-assessment time of like scoping their work and identifying their objectives. Also importantly, um, you know, one of the guide's objectives is to connect people with resources. So I'm going to visit that really quickly um, and then touch on how to implement findings or ways to implement them. Next. So one of the things we were really excited to do was to comb sort of the state of practice for who has figured out ways to address and tackle resilience across the marine transportation system. So we collected over 100 references, methods, guidebooks, data sources, and we really wanted to cater them um, and organize them so people would be able to apply them to the question at hand and define um, the level of effort needed to answer their questions. So we divided these resources into tiers, um, going from really, or tiers based on the information needed for decisions, the available funding and the amount of time. Um, so you would, if you were in a tier one, for example, you would be trying to quickly prioritize the critical functions of the system, identify key sectors or stakeholders, getting people to talk to get to each other for easy wins. Tier three all the way on the top would be a really in-depth way to qualitatively figure out how your system works and how the recovery processes might work after a, a disruption. And tier, tier two is somewhere in the middle there. Next slide. And then finally, and importantly, you wanna figure out how to implement your findings. Um, you don't want to do all of this work, come up with alternatives, recommend alternatives, and leave it there. Um, so the guide works to uh, sort of organize these implementation approaches, outlining how resilience selected resilience enhancements can be incorporated into plans, a process for monitoring and um, evaluating the effectiveness of these enhancements, continual awareness of threats and vulnerabilities, and being aligned or integrated into ongoing risk management activities. Um, so there's a lot of key points to keep these findings alive um, within your organization. Next slide. So um, I know this was quick and it was a broad overview of a lot of in-depth information we've got within this guide, um, but just to reiterate, we wanted to organize a general process and accompanying tools for conceiving, designing, and implementing a resilience assessment. We selected four key resilience objectives that we think every successful resilience assessment should utilize. And we really invested in case studies to make sure that we increase awareness and understanding of how to do a, an assessment itself. Um, and we're hoping that this guide is going to be a living document to continue to improve its resource compendium and expand the case study library. So with that, I think we'll go dive into case studies now. Thanks so much, Ms. Chambers. And you are exactly right. We're going to move straight into our next 
speaker, which will be Dr. David Young, Research Civil Engineer at the U.S. Army Engineer Research and Development Center. Dr. Young, you can take it from here. All right, can you all hear me? Everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay. So like Teresa said, my name is David. I work for the Army Corps of Engineers. My case study involves using AIS data to map the flow of vessel traffic all across North America. Once we have that vessel traffic description in place, we're going to be talking about how we can use an AIS derived map as a tool to inform resilience studies at the regional level. We're specifically going to be talking about the Caribbean region. So next slide, please. So let's quickly go over what AIS data actually is before I get into how we actually use it for this particular case study. AIS data was originally developed to aid in maritime domain awareness and vessel safety. Nearly all commercial shipping vessels in the United States are mandated by the Coast Guard to be equipped with it. It operates on the maritime radio frequency band and vessels continuously broadcast out their identity, their position, their heading, their course, and other information uh, out for anyone who has a receiver to pick those transmissions up. The Coast Guard has listening stations set up all around the country to pick up the transmissions from these vessels, and they are mandated by law to store that information. It turns out you can use it to answer a lot of other interesting navigation related questions. And that's why the Corps of Engineers uh, is interested in AIS data specifically, because we are in charge of maintaining our nation's navigable waterways. In a previous, uh, excuse me, a previous project, my colleagues, Catherine Chambers, who just spoke, and Brandon Scully explored using AIS data to monitor the response of commercial shipping to a major storm event. The event they picked was the response of Gulf shipping to Hurricane Harvey in 2020. And this figure here on the screen uh, is actually came from a paper that they wrote about that study. I'm not going to rehash the entire paper right here, but one of their big takeaways was that understanding how ports function as an interconnected network, so not just individual siloed ports, but as a, as a broader network, is really important if you want to know how the effects of disruptions uh, at one port can propagate outward from where they started and actually how the structure of the vessel traffic moving around those ports can actually provide some built-in resiliency for the entire system. So next slide, please. That's actually what we're gonna look at uh, right here. We're gonna use AIS data, specifically marine cadaster AIS data to quantify the structure of vessel traffic all across North America. We're just gonna restrict our analysis of that network to ports within Puerto Rico and the US and British Virgin Islands region. Uh, so that would be these ports here at the very bottom right hand uh, side of this figure here on the screen. Uh, the way this works is we predefine our polygons for all the ports that we have declared to be in our port network. We crawl through this AIS data to figure out when every ship enters and leaves the port polygon. We sort that list of AIS data points by each ship and then by time. And that gives us a record of the port calls for every single ship, including how long the ships spent in each one of our ports. Uh, once we have this, there's, there's a lot of things you can do with it. You can aggregate it by year or by port or by vessel type or different regions like we're going to do today. Pretty much any way you want, depending upon what you're trying to accomplish with this data set. Our specific port network we used for, for this study has 325 North American ports. Most of them are in the United States. Uh, the map of where all these ports are is shown here on the screen. Uh, we use AIS data from 2015 through the end of June 2020. So that is the time period over which we know the movement of all the vessels uh, across our different network of ports, which is our network of ports. We are quantifying the traffic all across North America so that when we look at individual regions, in this case, the Caribbean, uh, we don't miss how that regional traffic connects back, uh, in this case, to the stateside ports, right? To know if there's any vulnerabilities uh, in those connections that we might want uh, to be aware of. Next slide, please. Put this, yeah, the movie's playing, all right, great. So this movie plan here on the screen is showing what the traffic flow around uh, North America actually looks like around our port network. This movie is showing the transits between each pair of ports in our network, showing how many vessels transited between this uh, port pair based on the week the vessels arrived. So, so this, it does not show travel time at all. It only means that these vessels arrived in the week that's shown here on the movie. The opacity of the line is indicating the number of transiting vessels in log scale. It's in log scale because if you know anything about US ports, uh, traffic is very heavily weighed towards the largest ports in the country. This would be your Houston's, your South Louisiana's, your North New Jersey's. Uh, if it was a standard linear scale, you would actually not even see very many lines at all. You would just see a couple between these larger ports. So next slide, please. Oh, thank you. All right, so we're just going to talk about what we can learn from this that's relevant for the Caribbean specifically. So these, this map right here on the screen is the list of ports we're actually going to talk about today. 
They are all in Puerto Rico and the U.S. and British Virgin Islands, like I said. Next slide. So the traditional way of looking at ports, uh, particularly for the Corps of Engineers, is to think about them in terms of commercial tonnage numbers. So the table we're looking at here on the screen shows the tonnage of all the ports in the Caribbean region for FY19, excuse me, 18 and 17, and then how that ranks amongst our list of ports for a given fiscal year. Um, that's the number that's in parentheses after the actual raw tonnage values. I've included Jacksonville, Florida here at the top. Uh, it turns out to be a significant stateside hub for traffic to and from this region. And we'll talk about how I know that uh, on a subsequent slide. Uh, you'll notice that most of the Caribbean ports are actually not on this list. So that there were about 30 of them uh, on the previous slide where I showed the map. Uh, but there's only about 10 or so here on this table. And that's because once you get past uh, Fajardo, Puerto Rico, and please forgive me if I'm, if I'm butchering these pronunciations, uh, the ports are so small in terms of commercial tonnage that the Corps doesn't actually store tonnage information on them. So I've left uh, Guayanes, Puerto Rico here on the table to, to demonstrate that. And also because we'll, we'll see on a later slide that some of these smaller ports actually might be very meaningful and impactful uh, from a regional resilience perspective, right? Uh, so this table is doing a couple of things for us, right? On the one hand, it's giving us a very clear picture of where our major commercial tonnage hubs actually are. So it shows that, that San Juan and Ponce are, are the biggest uh, ports that receive a significant amount of commercial tonnage, but it's also highlighting some deficiencies uh, that you might run into if you're relying strictly on these tonnage numbers for disaster recovery or resilience related concerns. Uh, I just brought up that uh, smaller ports don't actually show up in these tonnage aggregations. So we, we also don't um, have more like finer time scales that we can look at uh, going straight through just tonnage. So the yearly time scale is the finest temporal resolution you can get uh, looking at core tonnage estimates. Uh, what that means is that we would not be able to track the activity of commercial vessels through a disruptive event like a hurricane. Uh, we also don't know what types of vessels are going to these ports directly from tonnage. We don't know where the cargo is coming from, and we don't know where the vessels are going to go next if we're looking strictly at raw tonnage. All of this can be improved upon by using information uh, from that map of vessel activity that we can construct from AIS. You, you may have also noticed that each of these fiscal year columns is subdivided in two. Uh, I just talked about the tons, but the, the second column within each fiscal year heading is the page rank value. I'm not going to talk about how, how page rank works so much right now. Uh, but suffice to say, it describes how central a given port is to the specific network that you're, you're looking at, and it's derived directly from the observed vessel transits. So that means we can quantify for any port we want uh, as evidence for the fact that we know the page rank value for Guayanes in particular, even though we didn't have any tonnage information. Next slide, please. So this slide right here is showing an example of some information about a specific port, in this case, San Juan that AIS gives you access to that might be important for examining vulnerabilities in regional traffic flows. So this right here is a, is a flow chart. The left-hand side of this flow chart is showing the influx of all cargo type vessels to the port of San Juan, as well as which port uh, those cargo vessels came from for all ports that had 10 or more such transits. So these are all the ports that sent 10 or more uh, cargo ships. I think I'm good on my time. Thank you very much, me. Um, to San Juan, the outflow arrows on the right are showing the cargo vessel departures from San Juan to other Caribbean ports. So, so right away we can see that the first thing AS is letting us do is subdivide our network into specific types of vessels. We're able to do this because the vessel type is actually stored in the AIS record and it's in those transmissions. Uh, this is very relevant for looking at regional, vulnerabil regional vulnerabilities to disruptions, maybe not for cargo vessels specifically, but we'll see that we're also able to do this for tanker vessels. People care very much about being able to bring in deep draft tanker vessel traffic. We can also see the utility and be able to see where these vessels are actually coming from. So, so just from our tonnage stuff on the previous slide, our tonnage aggregations, we could tell that San Juan was a major hub for this region. What we could not see at least is that at least for cargo vessels, Jacksonville is actually the largest stateside hub that feeds uh, this Caribbean region, right? This is despite the fact, despite the fact, excuse me, that it is actually much smaller than the other stateside uh, major cargo vessel terminals, right? So you can see that uh, Houston and New York, New Jersey are the other two stateside uh, ports that send a lot of cargo vessels to San Juan. This is very important, once again, for looking at vulnerabilities of specific regions, right? Uh, you need to know what ports that are external to your region uh, and that could be disrupted are going to actually impact your region if that is to occur. Uh, it also highlights how important it was for us to have ports that are, you know, extra to our region so we could see how the region connects back, right? This is, this is all um, of a piece. So next, next slide. Uh, this plot right here on the, shown on the screen is showing us the capability of AIS uh, 
for finding out information about smaller ports, uh, which can be very important as we're about to see for, for these regional resilience type studies. So this plot is showing the monthly tanker vessel arrivals to Guayanilla, Puerto Rico, uh, from all ports that had five or more total tanker transits to Guayanilla colored by the departure port. We're not overly concerned about what the departure port is uh, for the purposes of this talk. What matters though, is that Guayanilla was one of the ports that was not in the table of tonnage. I showed a couple of slides ago because it was too small. It doesn't have enough commercial tonnage to make, make the list. However, we can see very clearly from this plot that it is receiving a non-trivial number of tanker vessels. And this is presumably serving a steady market here. Uh, so the fact that Guayania can and does receive this deep draft tanker traffic is very relevant for any type of disaster recovery or resilience analysis of this region, right? In the event that your larger tanker port was disrupted, you might be looking for alternative destinations for uh, tanker vessels. Guayania clearly has the capacity to bring in these vessels even if the land side infrastructure might necessarily be able to offload or store that much cargo. So people are very concerned, once again, about bringing in these, these tanker vessels and deep draft tanker vessels. Uh, and this traffic is very clearly reflected in the AIS record, even if it was missing from those gross tonnage statistics. Next slide, please. All right, you can also get information on the comings and goings of a wider range of vessel types with AIS. So, so commercial tonnage, information it omits or largely omits leisure, passenger, and sailing vessels, which is, which is perfectly reasonable. These vessels are not carrying appreciable amounts of goods, but that doesn't mean that they don't contribute to your regional economy though, particularly in a place like the Caribbean with has a, such a heavy focus on tourism. These vessels and particularly the large, the large cruise ships in particular are in fact captured in the AIS record. Uh, the plots here on the slide are examples of this. So off to the, let's see, what is this? The, the bottom right, uh, we have the total number of arrivals to selected Caribbean ports that's broken out by the type of vessel. What you can see from this plot is that although San Juan, Puerto Rico was the port that had the largest commercial cargo tonnage, St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands actually has the most overall vessel traffic owing to very large numbers of sailing, leisure, and cruise ships. The plot right above that uh, is showing the number of cruise ship arrivals to St. Thomas broken out by month. The bars are once again color-coded based on the departure port. Uh, what's important to highlight about this plot is how seasonal cruise ship traffic is to St. Thomas. This, this is basically indicative of when people want to go on vacation to the Caribbean. Now, the, the seasonality of vessels carrying tourists might not be the most relevant for post-disaster recovery or resilience, uh, but seasonality can be highly relevant in other less tropical regions. The best example I have of this is the Great Lakes. You would find that the traffic of all types of vessels is highly seasonal on the Great Lakes due to winter icing. So it matters very, very much when your disruption actually occurs in these regions, uh, if you're relying on vessels to bring in needed goods and services, or if you want to see how those ports are impacted, uh, that's something you need to know is when disruption occurs. The ability to look at vessel traffic at finer timescales is, is a big advantage of using AIS-derived number descriptions. Uh, all my figures I've shown that there were time series uh, were all monthly arrivals, but our marine caster AIS data is reported at one minute intervals. So I could very easily be showing you weekly or daily arrivals if that's what we wanted to look at. And what this means is we could very easily look at behavior of shippers through hurricanes or other disruptions, uh, which not be, would, excuse me, would not be possible with a lower temporal resolution data set. Uh, next slide. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna skip this one in the interest of time. Uh, so we can go, we can just go to my, my questions slide. Thank you very much for listening to me this morning. I'm, I'm happy to have time for questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Young. Yes, we do have a few minutes uh, for questions. And while we wait for folks, again, if you have a question, drop it into the chat panel. Um, feel free to do so now. Uh, we did get a question that I think um, Dr. Young, Dr. Becker, Ms. Chambers, I think any of you might be able to weigh in on this. It is, was there ever a mention regarding changes in key components of a port system realized during an assessment that may render its results less effective moving forward. I'll be happy to at least partially answer that. Um, I don't know if Catherine or, or Dr. Becker have a different, um, I have a different, uh, so not as this study particularly, but in, in a, a study that we published a paper on sort of as a precursor to this work, um, we did find out a way to identify regions and communities of ports that did not just rely on geography because we, we found that that was saying like the Caribbean region or the Great Lakes region or whatever, uh, 
uh, we found that to be limiting, right? We, there's, you, can, you can identify these, these regions based on the actual observed vessel traffic, which certainly might render this, um, I don't know, might render this less meaningful if you find out through the course of this study that, you know, actually, I don't know, I'm, not, I'm just making this up, like San Juan is actually more of an East Coast region port based on the, the trading partners that it has. I don't know if that, I don't know if that answers your question. So I didn't do that as part of this study particularly, um, but that is something you might want to consider is, is how the structure of your traffic actually does affect what should be defined as a region. I think I would also just quickly tie in um, uh, sort of mentioning again that the challenge with resilience assessments at ports is defining the system, characterizing the system and figuring out those dependencies. Um, so, you know, one thing that came up quite frequently during the 2017 hurricane season was that while the ports were able to quickly reopen and there was a heroic effort to, you know, clear navigation channels, none of that was, well, I shouldn't say none, but it was less effective because some of the intermodal exchanges or highway networks or power networks were not available um, to support the movement of goods. Um, so I'm not sure if that's exactly answering the question here, but those dependencies or um, unexpected dependencies or dependencies that weren't considered are often ways that um, you have much less effective resilience in the end. Thank you, Dr. Young and Ms. Chambers. Again, if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to drop them into the chat panel and we'll address them as we have time. For now, let's move ahead onto our second case study, which will be presented by Dr. Craig Phillip, research professor, and Miguel Moravec, a PhD candidate, both from Vanderbilt University. Oh, good, good, good morning, good afternoon, and thank you, Teresa. Um, my name is Craig Phillip. I'm on the faculty at Vanderbilt. It's a particular honor to be part of this program. I've been involved in PIANC activities for many years, had the privilege to serve as a U.S. Commissioner. And I'll only say any of you that aren't already members of PIANC ought to become so. Um, also appreciate the um, opportunity to work at the intersection of the interests of the Corps of Engineers and DHS. Uh, as it relates to maritime infrastructure resilience. Uh, and I'm uh, pleased to be joined by one of our great grad students, Miguel Morevic. Um, go to the next slide. You can see that his background is, uh, is very impressive, um, working, having worked for US EPA, NOAA, the Navy, and uh, uh, Nissan. Next slide, please. Um, our mission as, the, as, as, as a part of the project team was to focus on some of the unique features that are associated, associated with the inland waterway portion of the maritime system in the United States. Um, uh, like the, um, like the, the broader system of ports and, and waterways, uh, out, out, outages on the inland system can have very significant impacts on the, on the overall system and the chart on the right kind of illustrates that for one of the locks on the Ohio River. Um, and it's certainly true that ports and terminals provide critical connections between the modes. That's largely their purpose. Um, in the case of the inland system, though, we also found that uh, multimodal optionality is something that really needs to be considered very carefully. Uh, and we'll talk about that further with one of the deep dive elements that, that uh, Miguel will go into in a few minutes. Um, Looking at the port portion of the system that we elected to uh, that we elected to do our deep dive into, um, we encompass the ports and terminals that uh, exist along the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers. Um, both of these rivers have their headwaters in the uh, in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, they both are navigable for an extended part of their length. Um, they both. Uh, they both uh, connect to the broader Mississippi River system at Paducah, Kentucky, uh, just a few miles up the Ohio River from the confluence of the Ohio with the with the Mississippi River system. And um, the uh, the numbers on the left, uh, the charts on the left are, are illustrative of uh, trying to uh, dimensionalize the magnitude of the, the, the of the impact that these two waterways have just on the state of Tennessee. 
Um, next slide, please. We, uh, uh, our work involved using the tools and methods that are, that are discussed and elaborated on in the guide and that you heard about earlier from Kathleen, um, and to, uh, and to apply those uh, in the resilience case study focused on this particular portion of the inland system. Um, we we, uh, we kind of subdivided our work into seven tasks and they're, they're identified here. Uh, they all relate to the assessment objectives that are shown at the bottom. Um, and they, they kind of uh, can be grouped into, into three broad elements. Um, we did extensive stakeholder engagement, which extended across uh, much of our work. Um, we did extensive characterization of the system from a variety of perspectives, and we're able to use many of the data sources that are identified in the broader guide. And we had tried to apply a fairly structured approach to the assessment of disruption scenarios um, as a way to develop uh, coherent resilient enhancement options. In terms of characterizing the region, next slide, please. Um, we are first used a number of tools and data sets that are identified in the um, in the in the in the guide itself, um, and those could be could be subdivided into four broad areas. Uh, we 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 enumerated the key assets and infrastructure. Uh, we evaluated the connectivity and opportunities for multimodal transfers, uh, a particularly important element. We thought um, we looked extensively at historical commodity flows. Um, we didn't, we used AIS data a little bit, but not extensively. And you've heard about that as one data source already um, from the earlier case study. Uh, and we, we went extensively into the uh, looking at specific disruptions and the potential impacts that those disruptions might have. We also took advantage of several collaboration opportunities uh, with groups that were already engaged in work, which while not directly resilience focused were closely aligned uh, one of the most important groups that we that we established a relationship with during our case study was called Thrive Chattanooga, uh, and it's focused broadly on uh, kind of multimodal uh, issues related to freight movements uh, in and around the uh, the Chattanooga, Tennessee area. Next slide, please. The guide itself and our work certainly focuses on extensive stakeholder involvement as a way to both identify uh, the right data to analyze and developing resilience enhancement assessments. Um, we convene multiple stakeholder groups during the course of our case study. Um, the, the results of the first of those case of those stakeholder engagements are shown on the slide here. Uh, we use the, the we use the interaction with the group to help define uh, the key assets in the region related to the maritime sector and to begin to catalog and characterize possible disruptive events that we could use uh, further in our analysis. Next slide, please. Um, one of our initial screens looked at, the, uh, looked at three particular disruption scenarios, uh, one involving the Colonial Pipeline Spur, uh, second involving uh, Cheatham Lock and Dam on the Cumberland River, and uh, we were particularly fortunate to have an ex extended maintenance outage uh, occur during our, during, our, during our study. And finally, we looked at the New Madrid Fault, which is a major earthquake risk uh, in the western part of Tennessee and, uh, and examined the, how that might impact the, these two waterways. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Miguel to talk more um, specifically about the, the work that we undertook to look at the Colonial Pipeline and its uh, relationships with the waterway system. Miguel? Uh, thanks so much, Craig. And by the end of my uh, five-minute spiel, I hope to uh, convince the audience today that there's a data-driven case to be made for diversifying your modes uh, in terms of delivering energy security. So uh, as Craig mentioned, uh, Colonial Pipeline has uh, certainly been in the headlines. We took a look at the most recent disruption uh, to assess its impacts uh, on resilience and the energy system. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to provide some context um, to the study area that Craig was describing, uh, before the turn of the century, almost all petroleum was delivered by barge um, to the uh, mid-Tennessee area. And you can uh, see that the Cumberland and Tennessee River were supplying uh, these resources. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
by 2010, uh, this completely changed. The Colonial Pipeline Spur uh, that delivers uh, fuel to Tennessee was added and nearly all petroleum products were now delivered by this pipeline. Next slide. Something interesting happened uh, recently though, by 2020, uh, certain markets diversified. And what you have here are, are two graphs um, showing petroleum uh, as it's delivered on a monthly basis. Um, as you go from orange to purple, you're going from 2012 to a current year, uh, so to 2020. Um, and as you can see in the Nashville market on the Cumberland River, um, the petroleum commodity shipments have increased from very little to almost 200 kilotons on average per month. Meanwhile, the Chattanooga, Chattanooga market, which is served by the Tennessee River, uh, has kept its petroleum uh, volumes about the same over the last 10 years. Both areas are served by the Colonial Pipeline primarily, uh, but Nashville supplementing uh, its petroleum products by waterborne shipments, uh, Chattanooga, not as much. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a larger, uh, more zoomed in snapshot of uh, these two markets and other commodities. And again, on the far right, you can see the, the key now, um, orange being 2012, uh, that dark purple being 2020. Um, next slide. And we'll go next slide again. Thank you. Okay, so um, you, may have, you may think we had a bone to pick with Colonial over that uh, ransomware disruption, but we actually started this study beforehand because there have been uh, numerous disruptions to the main line of the Colonial Pipeline that prompted this study of considering energy resilience. There's been a variety from natural disasters uh, hitting the Gulf and shutting down the entire operation. And there have also been uh, maintenance issues, leaks, explosions, things to that effect that cause large outages of the Colonial Pipeline. So that's why we were interested in uh, looking at this, uh, the energy resilience here. Next slide. So um, all the data you've seen so far comes from the U.S. Army Corps uh, Lock Performance Monitoring System. So we have government data showing the volumes of freight being moved on uh, the riverway uh, to these markets. In addition to that Army Corps data for this study, we brought in Gas Buddy data. A uh, Gas Buddy uses crowdsourcing, so average folks for their smartphone to report both prices and outages at the pump. Um, in particular cities. So during the Colonial Pipeline disruption, for the first time, we had this really exciting opportunity to leverage this crowdsourced data. And again, this data is trusted by big news outlets like NPR, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, um, to look on a day-by-day -day basis and say, hey, how are certain markets being affected by the Colonial Pipeline outage? Uh, next slide, please. As you can see, uh, we compared six different cities. Could you go back to Asheville there? We compared six different comparable southeastern cities, uh, three in North Carolina, which have no waterborne access, and then three in Tennessee, which have varying degrees of waterborne access, as you remember Nashville having the most. So Asheville, North Carolina, by the second week of that disruption, was still reporting 60% uh, gas station outages. Um, and as you'll know, we there are no waterborne volumes there. Most of the North Carolina cities had a high degree uh, two weeks into the disruption. Next slide. Meanwhile, Chattanooga, which receives some petroleum shipments by barge, um, was experienced about half as many outages, 30%. And you can see on the far right there, uh, per capita, uh, Chattanooga gets almost one ton of uh, petroleum per person uh, into its market by the waterways. So. Uh, half as many outages in Chattanooga with that supplement of uh, waterborne petroleum. Next slide. Nashville halves again, halves again the outage uh, percentage reported by Gas Buddy, um, about halves, and uh, has double the petroleum volume per capita, per capita uh, coming into its waterways to the Cumberland. So you're almost getting a 2.5 tons per person there of petroleum through the waterways. So. Uh, stepping back and looking at this, uh, it's an intuitive c conclusion to be sure, but this is a data-driven one that we have here, that diversifying the modes of your uh, freight services, in this case, energy security, is in fact um, an effective way to enhance the resilience of your city or region. And I'll let uh, Craig go ahead and speak to some of the other resilience enhancement options we identified uh, with stakeholders and with the data.
Thank you, Miguel. Uh, and just to wrap up with a few final slides. Um, yeah, we did have the uh, res resilience enhancement options, REOs is an important element of the of the of the the work uh, using the the resilience guide, um, and we had the benefit of uh, being able to uh, scrape um, uh, information and uh, insights from uh, previous DHS marine related projects, and we used these to help inform the the discussions we had with stakeholders, for example. And these are some, these, the ones that are enumerated, enumerated on the slide are from those various earlier DHS projects and. Uh, none of these will, will surprise any of you that have been working in the resilience world. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the, the uh, kind of the, the finish up here of our work, um, we did conduct stakeholder meetings that focused specifically on uh, three of the disruption scenarios, brought together experts from public and private sector. You're, you'll see some of them enumerated here. Uh, federal involvement from the Coast Guard, uh, from the Corps of Engineers and the Coast Guard, state officials from from Tennessee, and uh, various representatives of the uh, of the private sector uh, engaged as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then uh, just a kind of a few summary slides. Um, we. Um, we, we took each of these, uh, we took each of these um, major disruptions and used them to define um, what, can, what were considered to be promising resilience enhancement options for the region. Um, the first one won't surprise you, expanding Chattanooga and Knoxville terminals so that they can more readily accept um, uh, refined petroleum by barge. Um, the, the 10, 10 Tom was a, a waterway that also connects to this system and so uh, consideration of network effects uh, suggested uh, for our stakeholders that 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 uh, activating and uh, the uh, the use of the ten tom could be a vi could be a viable REO and finally something as uh, um, seemingly insignificant as updating building codes was identified as something that could have a proactive and positive effect on uh, res on the resilience of the system and for a final slide um, just a few takeaways. Um, uh, we think that the, the case study hopefully illustrates how the guide overall can be a very effective template um, to undertake uh, port resilience assessments. Um, um, a few of the things which I think our, our case study definitely confirmed was the value of stakeholder engagement, um, the value of having a well-defined process and uh, access to, uh, to good, robust data sets. Um, I think the consideration of scenarios uh, pr proved to be a particularly uh, important and effective uh, tool. Um, and we had a live scenario to, to consider with the outage of the Colonial Pipeline that happened during our study. Uh, and finally, taking a holistic approach to partnerships um, um, was, was something which I think proved to be very effective for us. Uh, and with that, uh, Teresa, I'll turn it back over to you and happy to take questions now or at the end. Thanks so much, Dr. Philip and Mr. Moravec. Uh, we do have a few questions coming into the chat panel and I encourage folks to continue sending those in. For the sake of time, we're gonna push forward in the presentation and save those questions for a final Q&A at the very end of the webinar. So we'll dive into our third case study, which will be presented by Dr. Martin Schultz, a research environmental engineer at the US Army Engineer Research and Development Center. Dr. Schultz, I'll hand the mic over to you. Thank you. Um, my presentation today is on probabilistic resilience assessment. Um, next slide. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Together, we represent the Environmental Laboratory and the Geotechnical Instructors Laboratory at the Engineer Research and Development Center in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Next slide, please. And uh, I'll start with a question, and that is, why should we use a probabilistic network approach for resilience assessment? Uh, the answer is that resilience assessment is about planning. Planning is about the future, and the future is shrouded in uncertainty. So probabilistic networks enable us to deal with these uncertainties in a rigorous way, and then to capture the dependencies among system components. Other benefits of the advantages of the method I'm going to talk about today are that it allows us to evaluate alternatives uh, with very different alternatives on common in common terms. It sets up a benefit cost analysis, which is 
what we need to do if we're going to choose between uh, implementing two or more alternatives. And then this approach is applicable to virtually any system. Next slide, please. And uh, the Columbia River forms the boundary between the states of Washington and Oregon in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this Terminal 6 is located in the city of Portland, about 100 river miles upstream from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the terminal is equipped to handle containers, autos, and freight bulk cargo. The entire region is known for being seismically active. That is, the, there are si regional seismic risks that are contended uh, with by uh, any industry uh, in, in the area. So our uh, resilience assessment addresses these regional seismic risks. Next slide, please. Uh, so the objectives of the resilience assessment were to quantify the seismic resilience of the container handling function, and then to evaluate alternatives uh, to strengthen resilience in the container yard. We also assessed the readiness and ability to support a federal staging area. I won't go into those uh, results in this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. And uh, so there are basically four steps to conducting a probabilistic resilience assessment. One starts with a probabilistic hazard analysis to estimate the frequency and the severity of disturbance events. And then uh, one constructs a model of the throughput capacity or productivity as a function of critical infrastructure component availability. And critical infrastructure components are any component that if damaged would reduce uh, capacity or productivity. And what's important here is we need to capture the dependencies among these critical infrastructure components. We then use this model of uh, throughput capacity to simulate many realizations of the resilience curve and accounting for the various uncertainties in component damage states and restoration times. Uh, from the resilience curve, then we can calculate a resilience metric, and that's the ratio of the residual capacity to maximum capacity over a fixed restoration period. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the, the, our probabilistic seismic hazards analysis quantified ground shaking and ground deformation for six return periods. And if you're not familiar with the concept of return period, it's the average number of years between seismic loads of a given severity. And so uh, what you need to remember here is the seismic loads with higher return periods are more severe and occur less often. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a representation of our infrastructure network. Um, the, each node represents uh, an infrastructure component or a group of components. And uh, the nodes and the down and the lower part of the network are dependent on the nodes on the upper part of the network. Our infrastructure components included electrical circuits and substations, uh, the structural and non-structural components of buildings, bridges that provide air clearance over the navigation channel, pavement, wharfs, cranes, and rail lines. And I don't have time to go into detail here, but the at the top of the network, you see all these yellow nodes. Those are our electrical circuits and substations. And so um, intuitively, what we take away from this is that the entire operation of the terminal is dependent on this connection to the electrical grid. And uh, we'll come back to that at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So, so uh, this is a representation. This is a, uh, we use our an model of annual throughput capacity to simulate uh, a resilience curve. Uh, could you step back, please? And um, this, okay. And uh, we generate 10,000 realizations of the return period curve. Uh, accounting for all of the various uncertainties. From the resilience curve, we calculate a status quo resilience metric, uh, and that is uh, uh, calculated by finding the area under the mean resilience curve. The status quo resilience metric is the expected fraction of maximum annual throughput capacity over one year, uh, given that the disturbance has occurred. Next slide, please. And here are the results. On the x-axis is the return period, 
Uh, so we have return periods up to 4,750 years. On the y-axis is the expected relative residual annual throughput capacity. And what we see here is we see a, star, a, a steep drop in the expected relative residual annual throughput capacity, and then uh, the curve levels off at higher return periods. So this is telling us that the system appears fragile to seismic loads with return periods less than or equal to 1,000 years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we explored five alternatives for uh, improving resilience. Our security alternative involves securing the ability to conduct optical character reader scans and radiation scans, which are required to move uh, containers in and out of the terminal. The communications alternative in involves securing the ability to track containers and communicate with uh, equipment operating in the container yard. The electrical alternative involved a seismic retrofit of substations and electrical circuits. Birth 603 involved a seismic retrofit of Wharf 603 and a restoration of disabled Panamax cranes. And the navigation alternative involved advanced contracting for removal of collapsed bridges uh, from the navigation channel. So I'll point out two things. One is the difference between secure and retrofit. When I say secure, I mean to make the functions impervious to loads so there would be no loss of function uh, given damage to existing infrastructure components. And then when I say retrofit, we're just hardening the components to reduce the probability of damage. Also then navigation is a non-structural alternative. Its focus is on making administrative processes more efficient. Next slide, please. Uh, and so the uh, benefits of alternatives are expressed here in terms of the expected increase in residual annual throughput capacity. Uh, and um, this table shows the results for the security communications alternative. In this last column, we have the benefits of the security communications alternatives together. There are two types of benefits, the conditional benefit that's the expected increase in annual throughput capacity over one year, given that the seismic load has occurred, and the overall benefit, and that's the expected increase uh, in annual throughput capacity over a 30-year planning horizon. So if we read this table, uh, if we implement the security alternative, we expect uh, a incre an increase in annual throughput capacity of 19,549 TEUs per year, given the occurrence of a 225 year event. Notice that the results, the benefits of the security, implementing the security alternative are quite high. Uh, implementing the communications alternative yields very low benefits. What happens if we implement both of these things together? Uh, our benefits are greater than the sum of these two separately. Uh, and we call this super additivity. The uh, what's going on here is that the failures in the security uh, system and the communication systems, they tend to occur together. So they're correlated and fixing the security failures, the problems in the security system. Uh, uh, we don't reala realize the full benefit uh, because failures in the communication systems continue to undermine uh, the capacity. I'll also point out that the uh, return that the uh, benefits are maximum given the 975 year return period. So these these alternatives are focused in on managing for more moderate risks. The overall benefits are in the last row here. Notice these are much lower than the conditional benefits. Why is this? It's because the return periods of the seismic loads that we're considering uh, are much greater than the 30 year in the, the 30 years of the investment planning horizon that we're uh, calculating benefits over. Okay, next slide, please. And the, the uh, benefits of the other alternatives are summarized here. Notice that the, again, the benefits are with the, the benefits of the electricals and retrofits, benefits of uh, retrofitting the birth 603 and restoring Panamax cranes, and then the NAV, uh, NAV 
um, invest, uh, implementing uh, uh, advanced contracting for uh, in the navig uh, for removal of collapsed bridges from the navigation channel. And then the final column, the benefits of implementing all of these. So again, we see the benefits are super additive, uh, but less so than uh, implementing the security communications alternatives together. Uh, and note that the electrical system has uh, investments in the electrical system produce relatively few benefits in terms of uh, increasing throughput capacity. Why is this? When particularly contrast that with the relative importance of the electrical system uh, at the terminal in terms of uh, the infrastructure network. Uh, these benefits are low because the uh, electrical systems are generally restored very quickly following a disturbance, uh, whereas the damages to some of these other system components will continue to undermine uh, capacity despite uh, improving that system. Also notice that the uh, conditional benefits are a maximum for the highest return periods for both 603 and NAV. Um, and why is that important? That's important because if we calculate the overall benefits for these uh, alternatives, these two alternatives that are focused on managing for the more severe risks, uh, they're proportionally lower than the uh, overall benefits of, imp of uh, investing in the uh, security communication systems, which are those alternatives were focused on managing the more moderate risks. Um, and then, uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to uh, leave you with a few key uh, takeaways from this resilience assessment. Uh, one is that when we evaluate multiple alternatives, uh, we have to simulate the benefits of those jointly. Um, those benefits could be super or indeed sub additive, and we can't analyze them one at a time and then add the benefits up. Resilient strengthening alternatives differ in terms of the frequency and severity of the damages they mitigate and the length of the restoration time that's avoided. These are important and complex variables that uh, we need to use quantitative analysis to understand. Uh, so quantitative analysis is essential and we can't substitute our intuition for that. Uh, and when we compare or we choose between investing in one or more alternative two or more alternatives, we have to evaluate those alternatives on the using a benefit cost analysis. Uh, we've expressed benefits here in terms of TEUs per year, so they're easily monetized. And uh, but when we calculate benefits and cost, remember we have to calculate those over an investment planning horizon. And finally, then uh, non structural measures can be effective alternatives. We saw that with the benefits of the non well of the navigation alternative being greater than the benefits of the, uh, the birth 603 uh, infrastructure hardening alternatives. And with that, then I can take any questions that uh, you may have. Thanks so much, Dr. Schultz. And yes, that is our final presentation. So we'll actually be moving into a Q&A period at this point in time. And I'll go ahead and start reading off some questions that we received earlier in the webinar. If you have any questions on Dr. Schultz's presentation, please also drop those into the chat panel now. So the first question we'll be reading, uh, Ms. Chambers, maybe you can address this and um, kick it out to whoever may be able to pro provide additional information. Reports that have no real port authority governance, but are more a cluster of waterside businesses, who initiates and who conducts an assessment? The complexity of the tool looks like it would be overwhelming for a municipal agency. Maybe a state agency would be a better fit. Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. Um, definitely the champion of the resilience assessment needs to be somebody who is actively engaged um, and can convene uh, folks of interest to really, who can really represent um, the needs of the system that you're talking about. So a cluster of businesses, you're gonna wanna have them represented at the table. But um, yeah, as far as who initiates and conducts it, I think there needs to be a requirement that there's some funding available um, for them to do the work. 
And if it's a lot, then maybe it can be something like Dr. Schultz's work where you have a very rigorous qualitative analysis, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a major complex effort. We've tried to build in some flexibility to this tool so that you'd get um, some objectives done quickly and simply by just getting people together to talk. Um, so I'd like to kind of reiterate that point is that it doesn't always have to be you know, a multi year effort and we've tried to include that flexibility in the guide. Thanks so much, Ms. Chambers. Um, and I'm going to segue into our next question, which is thanks for your input and the relation to defining a system, which can be in a state of high volatility. Uh, I think the question here is, what would you recommend to try to avoid 1 of 2 outcomes, either entering into a perpetual resilience study prolonged due to frequent changes in the system or completing a study and its results or recommendations are later rendered less effective due to changes in the system that changed during the study. And this may be a good fit for uh, Dr. Philip and Mr. Moravec. The, um, I don't have a, uh, a Specific response to the uh, to the to the question quite as it's um, as it's posed. There's the um, you know we're we're part part of the reason we're here is because of the changes that are being thrust upon the system, both changes in what's being asked of it, and also um, the kind of the exogenous changes like climate change that are um, that are altering the uh, the complexity of the of the the uh, threats that 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 are that are confronted by the by the system. Um, I don't think that either of those should be something that would that would slow down or stop someone from wanting to to engage uh, robustly in this um, in this kind of effort. And I would say that um, one of the one of the takeaways for me from the work that we did was how insightful and important the the engagement with stakeholders was and the process of of uh, assembling those stakeholders to sp focus specifically on these issues um, was, I thought, a really powerful um, way to to get clarity on, on uh, kind of what options might be might be attractive. And it uh, much of that didn't rely on uh, on kind of um, the kind of sophisticated analysis, um, benefit cost analysis that we just uh, heard about. Not that uh, that kind of work uh, can't also be very important, but the, um, uh, I think the uh, having a structured way to ask the right questions was, at least in our experience, just about as valuable as the, the analytical work that, uh, that we also, in parallel, were engaged in. To very briefly echo Craig, the stakeholders knew um, we were able to uh, you know, bring that to life with some data analysis, but the stakeholders knew um, you know, this disruption had happened before. So often there are warning signs the stakeholders are well aware of that we were just bringing to life um, with the study um, and engaging in stakeholders may, may save you a lot of that um, analysis uh, or sort of the inhibition uh, to, to take on such a large analysis if you get that stakeholder input first help narrow things for sure. Thanks. Thanks so much for that response. And Dr. Phillip, I'm going to keep you on the line. Our next question is, does Dr. Phillip have any comments on the difference or relevance of scheduled versus unscheduled lock outages in his resiliency assessment? Or is that not truly a relevant variable in resilience? Oh, a uh, great question and uh, absolutely um, a really important uh, feature. And and I'd have to say in my, uh, my history engaged in the uh, in uh, kind of the inland maritime sector uh, as a as a vessel operator, um, the, um, the the core has been really focused on on uh, more proactively um, anticipating need and uh, and establishing schedules for uh, for work that might be disruptive. Um, and as I mentioned, we we actually had a, a significant scheduled. Um, outage that was in process during our during our study period at Cheatham Lock on the Cumberland River. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the ability to, uh, to think ahead and plan for that as opposed to confronting an unscheduled outage um, was uh, uh, is really important um, from the from for all the stakeholders. And I would I would add that we had a we had an interesting corollary to that. It wasn't a lock outage, but 
you may recall that there was a significant disruption um, associated with uh, a structural failure uh, on one of the uh, bridges going over the, the Mississippi River in Memphis. Uh, that also happened during our study. And the, um, and, uh, the, the disruption from that um, was very significant uh, on, our, on the system that we were interrogating, the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers. Um, in some ways, uh, probably more so than the, the schedule block outage that was happening in the midst of, on our system per se. I have to add, um, thanks to uh, Megan and Catherine and our friends at the core, um, the Cheatham Lock was able to pause its maintenance and allow uh, petroleum product barges to pass through and get to the national market. We, you know, we uh, really appreciate the uh, core engaging with uh, industry to allow that to happen to keep Nashville going. Um, and so we, we do account for that uh, in, in our uh, in our resili resiliency assessments, of, of, of course. Um, and again, more, more reason to engage with the stakeholders and workshop these things through for future disruptions. If it had been unscheduled maintenance on the lock, we may not have been able to have those petroleum barges get to Nashville. Thanks so much for that input. And we are approaching the end of our time. Uh, and so I'm going to push us forward. Um, if your question goes unanswered, we'll try to follow up with you after today's webinar. But first and foremost, I would like to thank everyone again for joining today. We hope you'll join an upcoming Tiank USC event, such as the Tiank America 2023 conference taking place in Florida next April. And we're actually uh, calling for abstracts for that conference. And so we encourage you to submit your abstract on your project, innovation, technology that you think um, might be of interest to this group. Finally, we'll be sharing two links to formally close out today's event. First, all participants in today's webinar are eligible to earn one and a half PDHs for their attendance. You can follow the link on the screen and in the chat panel and use the password guide to get your customized PDH certificate. That password is case sensitive and it is all lowercase. Second, we greatly value your feedback. You'll also find a link to a brief five question evaluation form in the chat panel. If you have a minute, we would really appreciate your input on today's event. And that does it. Thank you again for joining us today to learn about the Marine Transportation System Resilience Assessment Guide. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I hope to see you at future PNQSA events.